Ok, bonjour à tous. Nous allons commencer cette session. Je suis Boris Piolin. Et au nom des organisateurs, c'est un grand plaisir de vous accueillir à cette session grand public de la conférence Stringmat 2016. C'est aussi la 21e session du séminaire Henri Poincaré, Bourbafi pour les intimes. Avant toute chose, je, vais, je voudrais annoncer un changement de programme que vous voyez ici sur l'écran. Donc malheureusement, le professeur Nigel Hitchin n'a pas pu venir. Et donc l'exposé de l'après-midi de professeur Akani Ahmed est avancé à 15h30, donc après une pause café qui le sépara de l'exposé précédent. Donc je vais passer en anglais, car comme vous pouvez le voir, les exposés euh, aujourd'hui seront en anglais. So, welcome everyone to this uh, general public session of the String Math 2016 conference, which is organized jointly with the seminar Henri Poincaré, and in partnership with the Clay Mathematics Institute. As you've just heard, there is a small change of program, which you can, uh, you can see on, on the screen. So, the String, conference, String Math Conference has been taking place uh, here at Collège de France since uh, Monday. It has gathered over 200 physicists and mathematicians from all over the world to discuss exciting new developments at the juncture between theoretical high energy physics and mathematics. So, for those foreign to this field, it may come as a surprise that mathematicians and physicists have anything in common besides the use of Greek alphabet and uh, calculus. But in fact, as will hopefully become clear during these uh, four lectures today, over the last 30 years, there has been a very intense dialogue between the two communities, or at least between those uh, sub-communities interested in such topics as uh, topology, algebraic geometry, number theory on the math side, and particle physics at the highest en available energy scales on the physics side. So the stage on which these two communities uh, have uh, come to face is uh, face to face is uh, quantum field theory and more specifically string theory, which is a general framework proposed in the late 60s, early 70s to unify all fundamental forces in nature under the roof of special relativity and quantum mechanics. So this 40-year-long uh, quest to achieve this goal, and indeed to understand what is really string theory, has uncovered profound connections with many fields of mathematics, has opened new avenues for particle physics, for theoretical physics more generally, and it has opened up new branches of mathematics. And this is the topic of this session today. Physics intuition has provided completely new points of view on objects that mathematicians thought they completely understood. And it has motivated many deep conjectures, which they, mathematicians, have been able to prove using their own rigorous methods. So I will not say more about it, because we will hear abundantly about it today through this session. And instead, I will uh, introduce our first speaker today, Professor Hiroji Ogori from uh, California Institute of Technology in the US, Caltech, and also from the Cavalry Institute for the Mathematics of the Universe in Japan, APMU. And he's going to introduce, introduce, us, introduce us to the theoretical challenges posed by the weakest of all fundamental forces in nature, which is also the most relevant one at long distances, namely gravity. So after uh, two years in the graduate school uh, at Kyoto University, Professor Ogori became a tenured faculty member at the University of Tokyo before getting his PhD from the same uh, in 1989. In 1994, he was appointed professor at Caltech, uh, sorry, at uh, Berkeley, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he stayed there until 2000, and uh, he became, at that time, a professor at Caltech. So currently, Professor Augury is the Fred Cavalli Professor of Theoretical Physics and Mathematics, and the director of the Walter Burke Institute for Theoretical Physics in Caltech, a newly created uh, institute. He's also the principal investigator of the Cavalli Institute for the, uh, well, IPMU in, in uh, Tokyo. Professor Oguri has received numerous awards and honors, including the Eisenberg Prize for Mathematics and Physics, uh, the Humboldt Research Award, the Nishina Memorial Prize. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Simons Investigator, and the trustee of Aspen Center for Physics. And, but besides his outstanding involvement and engagement in research, Professor Oguri is also very active in science outreach. Uh, his uh, four popular science books have been sold over a quarter million copies in Japan. His book in Super String Theory was selected for the 2014 Kodansha Prize for Science Books. 
He's a contributing writer for Asahi Shimbun, the uh, leading national newspaper in Japan. And uh, well, most recently, he served as a science advisor to the 3D dome theater movie called The Man from Nine Dimensions, uh, which debuted in Tokyo this April. And I learned has just received the 2016 Best Educational Production Award from the International Planetarium Society. So we very much hope that we have the pleasure of seeing this uh, movie in Paris uh, soon. Uh, it was not possible to organize it today, unfortunately. So, Professor Gary, many thanks for accepting our invitation to speak at this uh, joint topic session. And please tell us what is gravity. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you, Boris, for your very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, on, uh, on, on this uh, beautiful uh, Saturday morning in Paris uh, to hear about gravity, monodromy, quantum geometry, and the end of space time. So, so I would like to tell you about what we know about gravity. So let me turn it on. And I'm supposed to have one hour, I believe. So start it. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this is a very nice venue, and for those of you who are not involved in this uh, uh, Springs Mass Conference, and, uh, which this is the last, of the, uh, uh, last day of the conference, and in fact, this talk is for those of you who are not at this conference. Uh, we had this very nice uh, conference, which, about which I will tell you more about uh, in the, in, in later in the talk. But this is also a very uh, nice place for me because 12 years ago, uh, our friend in Paris also organized the annual uh, Strings Conference 2004 uh, at this exactly the sa same venue, and we see that we took group photo around the same place. And uh, in fact, I was asked to give a summary talk uh, at, that, at this conference, and I remember sitting on that corner, uh, listening every talk, uh, taking notes uh, to give a summary talk, and you see, actually, I'm, I'm here. And uh, I'm here with actually my daughter, uh, who was uh, four years old at that time. She's 16 now, so I don't think I can do that anymore. So it's kind of a nos nostalgic uh, occasion. So, uh, so today I'd like to tell you about gravity. And of course, we, we all think that we know about gravity. Gravity is the uh, uh, most familiar force uh, in nature. But it's actually, I'm, I would like to tell you that it's the most mysterious of all the forces. And it actually also holds the key to some of the deepest secrets of the universe. Uh, so this is actually the first of four uh, uh, public lectures scheduled for today. So I'm sort of an uh, appetizer for the rest of the three talks. So, so my talk will be intended to be very sort of uh, general public and uh, want to motivate you to, to learn more about this in the following three talks. So I thought I should organize my talk uh, according to seven wonders uh, of the world of gravity. You might have heard, of course, about the seven wonders of the ancient world. I was told that there was a time of the history when all of these uh, seven objects, including a pyramid in Giza and the hanging garden uh, of Babylonia, uh, existed. And so it was sort of a tour guide or Michelin uh, in the ancient Mediterranean world. And uh, uh, so today, I'd like to give you a tour uh, of the world uh, of gravity. So I organized my talk according to seven questions or one, uh, uh, mystery of the gravity. And the first mystery is actually the gravity is a force. And of course, these days, we take it for granted. But it wasn't obvious for people in the ancient world. For example, Aristotle thought that uh, uh, the, the gravity is actually not a force, but it's just a reflection of the tendency for objects to go, try to go to the center of the Earth that uh, all the elements, uh, all the um, objects are made of four uh, basic constituents, and we are mostly made of earthy objects, which want to go back uh, to the center of us, just like a bird which lays the nest in the morning, want to come back uh, to the nest in the evening. And uh, it wasn't such an absurd idea, because uh, these days, of course, we know that there are planets and other stars that attract and interact with each other by gravitational force. But of course, originally, we only know the gravitational force in one direction, and it was more attractive to understand, try to understand it as a tendency uh, of the object to try to go to the center of the Earth. And this kind of view lasted for 2,000 years. 
And uh, the change of the view, in order to change this kind of view, it's actually very important uh, to define the object or concept properly. So we have been doing this, uh, we have been having this conference of the interaction of physicists and mathematicians. And what mathematicians always tell us, physicists, is that it's very important to define things and to understand their concept exactly. So similarly, in the case of force, we need to actually define what the force is. And uh, that's one of the things uh, Newton did. What are the forces? And uh, so Newton defined the force as something that changed the motion. If there are no earth here, that this uh, ball, which is something that is happening this week in Paris, I understand, would just go uh, straight. But because of the gravitational attraction, it changed the shape of the trajectory. So that, according to his definition, is the existence of the force. So now we understand that there are actually four forces in nature, gravitational force, electromagnetic force, those are understood uh, uh, 400 years ago. And in fact, the uh, understanding of electromagnetic force uh, were earlier. But then uh, in the 20th century, uh, we came to realize that there are actually two more forces in nature, strong force and weak force. Strong force attracts quarks, which are constituent of uh, elementary particles, such as protons uh, and neutrons are made of three quarks. And the pion, which mediate force between these elementary particles, uh, consists of two quarks. And strong force attracts quarks to each other and make those uh, particles. Weak force is responsible for radioactivity, sunshine, etc. And of course, we are in Paris, where the radioactivity was discovered by Becquerel and developed further by Marie Curie and many other chemists and physicists who are working in Paris. And so one of the realization uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the weak force uh, uh, that came with the uh, realization of the existence of weak force and strong force is that uh, we have to enlarge the concept of force. So at the time of Newton, the force was understood as something which changed the trajectory of particle. But in the case of weak force, it also changed the type of particle. So you have to enlarge the concept of force as something which change the condition or the state of the object. So trajectory or velocity is a, a ty one type of uh, uh, state, but type of particle is another. And changing that should also be understood as force. At any rate, we now understand that there are actually uh, four types of force in nature, uh, strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity. And among them, it turns out that gravity is the weakest of the, all the fundamental forces that we know. So that's the second wonder of the gravity. The gravity is the weakest uh, of the all, all, all forces. So you might think that that's absurd, that uh, this is the strongest force that we feel every day. That's why you are sitting on the chair of this auditorium and not floating in the air. But if you think about it, it's actually uh, opposite. For example, usually I bring this uh, prop with a small magnet. But uh, if you think about the magnet here, and then suppose you have some kind of uh, metal clip or something, then if you ap uh, approach the uh, magnet to the clip, it's gonna, uh, clip is going to jump to the uh, uh, magnet. So that means that actually the uh, magnetic force from the magnet is stronger than the gravitational fo force from the Earth. And the magnet is just a few grams, whereas the Earth is billion times billion times billion gram. So, so that means that the magnetic force, even though it's exerted from very tiny objects, is much stronger than this big uh, the gravitational force from the Earth. There is uh, another way to think about it. So for example, I'm standing on this podium and it's not going under the Earth. If I bang on this table, it's actually quite, I did it too much, so it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's hard, but uh, uh, it's hard because it's very solid. And it's very solid, but partly, well, one of the reasons to understand it is it's an electromagnetic force. That there are a lot of electrons in my hand and there are lots of electrons on the table, in the inside of the table. So if I bang it, there is a, a, a electromagnetic repulsion between them. And that's why I cannot, I, I cannot put my hand through the table. And that's why even though I'm feeling gravitational attraction, I won't go under the podium. So, so this is another demonstration 
that the electromagnetic force is actually stronger, much stronger than the gravitational force. And uh, so it's not, gravity is not only weakest of the four forces, all the forces, but it's actually much, much weaker. And in fact, that's one of the mystery of the gravitational uh, force that we actually do not quite understand. So I'm going to actually tell you various mystery of the gravity today, some of which we understand and some of which we are actually still developing. And this is one of them, why gravity is so weak compared to other forces that uh, well, we know. The third mystery is actually you can turn off gravity. So even though you feel gravity every day, but you can arrange so that you can turn off gravity. So here is an example. So of course you know this uh, gentleman, Stephen Hawking, uh, 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 one of the uh, very uh, important contributors to the study of uh, gravitational force and uh, uh, other aspects of uh, fundamental laws of nature. And he's floating, the gravity is turned off inside of this room. Uh, of course, um, what is happening is that this is a free fall. So, so you have an airplane and all the uh, windows are sort of closed so that you can see outside. And then the, 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 the plane, I, if I do this, uh, uh, drop this, then I'm gonna damage the podium. So, so the, the, the plane just go free fall. And of course, eventually it's gonna turn on the uh, uh, engine and then go up again. But for this brief period, uh, you feel that the gravitational force is turned off. And of course, this is uh, something you also feel. For example, when you are riding on an elevator, when the elevator goes up, you feel that your gra uh, gravitational, your weight, you wait a little bit more. You feel you wait a little bit more. So that means that gravitational force is getting stronger. When the elevator goes down, you feel that the gravitational force gets weaker. So this is a sort of exaggerated situation where in the complete free fall, the gravitational force is turned off. So it seems as though that the way gravitational force acts, depending on your point of view, and uh, this is uh, actually, uh, this is observation that Einstein called the happiest thought of his life. So as uh, we will see uh, later, uh, Albert Einstein in 1905 uh, made three important discoveries. Uh, one of which is the discovery of special relativity that we'll talk about later. Uh, another is the explanation of uh, Brownian motion. And uh, the other is the explanation of uh, photoelectric effect, which is sort of precursor to quantum mechanics. But even though he made these uh, uh, three important discoveries, but he didn't immediately get an academic job. So the, for the ne next uh, three years or so, he was still working on the patent, in the patent office. But, uh, the, his boss realized that uh, Einstein is actually really talented, so he actually gave him lots of free time to think about things. So he was sitting in, in his patent office, and then one day realized that for an observer falling freely from the roof of a house, the gravitational force does not exist. And this led to the, his construction of general theory of relativity 10 years later. So, but that requires uh, uh, some more uh, 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 study, and that took him, that's why it took him 10 years uh, to come to general relativity. And that is that uh, he actually uh, started from this observation and realized that you can actually describe gravity as warping of space and time. So it took him 10 years uh, to turn this idea uh, into uh, mathematical reality. So in order to uh, discuss that, we need to understand what is space and uh, what is time. And this is, again, one of the things that uh, people have been uh, pondering and uh, thinking about for thousands of years. And it's, again, go back to Aristotle. Uh, he made a famous uh, a statement that nature abhors a vacuum. And sometimes this statement is referred to as saying that, well, it's very hard to make a vacuum because you have to extract the air. But it's not as simple as that. He thought that space and time are defined in such a way that it, it describes the matter in it. So for example, uh, the space is there to tell you where the object is, and the time is there to describe how it develops. So without matter, there is no space and time. So that was his idea, that, uh, his, that was the reason for his statement that nature abhors a vacuum. So, so in his point of view, the space and time are closely tied to the matter and object in it. 
this type of idea was sort of totally uh, uh, changed uh, by Isaac Newton. So he introduced a concept of absolute time and absolute space. So absolute time is something that flows uniformly from infinite past to infinite future. And absolute space is there independent of what's happening uh, inside of it. So for him, space and time is something like a theater or stage where things happen. So this is the kind of idea of space and time that we uh, are familiar with uh, in everyday life. So for example, when we go out to work in Paris, uh, we often consult our uh, Apple uh, on, on my iPhone or smartphone to tell us exactly where we are. And uh, uh, so these days, uh, the, the watches and iPhones and the smartphones are so accurate that everybody have exactly the same time. And so uh, Boris will tell you when I should stop my talk. But uh, so, so this kind of idea of absolute space and absolute time is very familiar concept. But this was invented only 400 years ago. But since uh, because of this uh, Newton's uh, 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 idea of classical mechanics has been so much used in our everyday life, so, so we take it for granted. But in fact, uh, 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 100 years ago, uh, by Albert Einstein, uh, this concept was again totally revolutionized. And uh, not only the space and time depends on observer, but it also depends on how things is happening inside of it. So the first half of the revolution is a concept that space and time depend on how you observe it. So let me demonstrate uh, how he came to this idea. So suppose uh, uh, you have uh, two people in a room, and then say, suppose th th they are captains of baseball team, and they want to decide who goes first and who goes uh, next. And uh, I don't know, in, in France, do you, do you know the con concept of uh, uh, stone, scissor, and paper? Do you do that as a kid? So, so they decided that they, they figured out that they can, they can actually fairly uh, uh, decide who do that by, by doing this, that's a stone, paper, and scissor. And so there is a light source in the middle, exactly in the middle. And then judge turns on the light signal. The light propagates at the same speed. And then when they see it, they do this. So for example, this captain has stone, then this captain has uh, paper. So he won. But it turns out that uh, there are people who are actually ob observing it from outside of the room and they claim that they are not fair. This wasn't fair. Because it turned out that they are riding a uh, 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 train. And the train was f going very fast, very close to the speed of light, very unrealistic. But suppose that was the case. Then in that case, actually, as the train was going in this direction, if the speed of light is the same independently of uh, how fast you are going, then the light comes to him before uh, the light reaches the other person. So this doesn't look fair, because indeed, actually, he, he won. So, so this looks very suspicious. So, uh, so this demonstrates that concept of simultaneousness, simultaneity, depends on who, how you observe it. From those two people who are inside of this train, uh, it looks as though they are doing this simultaneously. But for those, for those people who are watching it from outside, they are, these two events are not simultaneous. So, so Einstein realized that if you accept the point of view that uh, the speed of light is independent of how you observe it, then the concept of uh, simultaneousness has to be modified. He even went further and said that actually, if you have uh, taken into account the gravitational force, then the matter in it and energy in it also modify space and time. So this is sort of a caricature. Now, it's kind of difficult. So this is supposed to be for general public. I saw there are some mathematicians, but I totally ignore them. And uh, uh, so I will try to explain how actually the modification of the uh, uh, space and time changes, uh, give, give rise to effect uh, that mimic gravitational force. So it's kind of hard to explain that uh, in our three-dimensional space. So let, let's just uh, postulate that we live in two spatial dimensions. So there is actually a very nice uh, novel uh, written in 19th century uh, Victorian uh, England uh, called Flatline. So this is a story about uh, people who are living in two-dimensional flat space. 
And so it, it, it's a Victorian world. It, it was very hierarchical. So there are various different types of people. There are triangular people, which has three edges. And there are square people, and uh, pentagon, octagon, etc. And as the number of edges increase, you are more higher in your social hierarchy. And clearly, circle is at the highest uh, of, the, uh, of the social hierarchy. So this story is about Mr. Square. So Mr. Square was one day, so he's like a middle class man, walking in the street of uh, uh, Flatland, and then noticed something in front of him. And then there was like point, dot. But then it came out, became circular. So this is clearly somebody who is superior to him. But then it became larger and larger, and they shrunk and disappeared. So he wondered what happened. So what happened was that it turns out that even though uh, the, those people are living on this flatland, but they were actually embedded in three-dimensional space. And then there was a ball living in, in it. And the ball was actually visiting the flatland. So uh, eventually, uh, Mr. Square became friendly with uh, Mr. Ball, and Mr. Ball took him to the three-dimensional world, and then uh, 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 Mr. Square realized what is the kind of space that he was living in. And then he went back to Flatland and tried to explain that to everybody, and nobody believed him, so this kind of story. So anyway, so suppose uh, Einstein was in this Flatland. What kind of gravitational theory that he would have invented? Uh, if I actually uh, reduce the three-dimensional, uh, the Einstein theory in three-dimensional space to this flatland, then his theory would look like this. So let's uh, get a piece of paper, and suppose you put some heavy object in the middle. What this object does to this two-dimensional two world is that it creates what's called the deficit angle, which is the following concept. So if you have a point, and then if you go around the point as uh, 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 elementary school or junior high school, uh, geometry tells you that uh, you, go, you are going around 2 pi, namely 360 degree as you go around. However, if you have heavy object here, according to Einstein's theory in two spatial dimension or flat land, then you eat part of this angle, and then it becomes like a cone. So now, as you go around here, so you ignore this point anymore, then it's less than 360. And so this is the deficit angle. It's deficit from 360. And the heavier the object, the bigger the deficit angle. So, so what happens is that so if you have, say, for example, deficit angle here, and if you have two straight lines, so, so this, this object in flat line just try to go to straight line. However, since there is a deficit angle, so they actually converges. They look like they converge if, if these are, are, are glued together. So because of the deficit angle, these two uh, uh, blue particles travel just as if they are attracted to this heavy object here. So, so therefore, according to this rule, the, if you have heavy object, the shape of this two-dimensional surface changes, and that acts just as if there is a gravitational force acting on it. So. Einstein's idea is essentially sa the same in three spatial dimensions also, although it requires a little bit more mathematics. But it's also important that gravity also warps the time, namely it changes the way that uh, the time flows. And in fact, in our everyday life, for example, the kind of gravity that we feel on the Earth, this effect is more important. So the gravitational force uh, changes the motion of particle and other objects by modifying the geometry of the space, but also changing the way that time flows. So for example, when Einstein calculates the bending of light near the sun, he discovered that the amount was twice as much as that you would have obtained if you just used Newton's uh, uh, theory. And the factor too came from the fact that the gravity uh, from the sun modified the geometry of three, three spatial dimensions near the sun, but also change the way that time travels, time flows uh, near, the, near the sun. And these two effects combine to give you factor two in that case. The most extreme situation to demonstrate the, the, the warping of time happens near the black hole. 
This is an ex uh, ex uh, extreme example of warping of time. The, uh, uh, the black hole is an object that is so heavy that even the light cannot escape uh, from it. So namely, the escape velocity from the surface of black hole is the speed of light. And so therefore, nothing can come out from the black hole. But even nothing can come out from the black hole when you go inside of the black hole by free fall, if the size of the black hole is large enough, then you shouldn't, according to Einstein's theory, feel any force except for tidal force when the size of the black hole is small uh, because of this uh, equivalence principle that we talked about, namely that when you are freely falling, you don't feel the gravitational force. So therefore, I get a mission uh, from my wife to explore the black hole. So, so she asked, she tells me, so this is supposed to be black hole. And near the black hole, there is a, a surface of no return where the escape velocity is the speed of light. And then I was instructed to explore this area. So I promised her that I'm gonna send her email every day to report what's happening. So for the first few uh, uh, days, she gets uh, email from me every day. But eventually it became once a week, once a month, once a year, and then she stopped receiving uh, email from, from me. So, but that, that's not quite fair because I think I'm sending her email every day. But she doesn't think so, so she, looks at, she, she thinks that I'm actually procrastinating near the black hole, trying not to get inside of the black hole. Even though I'm sending email to her every day and in fact going inside of the horizon. So that is, this is an extreme case where depending on observer, uh, how the time flows, look, look, how the time looks to flow uh, differently. So from her perspective, the time near the black hole is flowing very slowly. So, so I'm not going inside of the black hole anymore. But from my perspective, since I'm freely falling, so I'm not feeling gravitational force. So I can just straight, go straight inside of the black hole. So this is another way that uh, gravitational force uh, change the way that uh, the time uh, uh, flows. This is a very foreign concept, but this is actually used in our everyday life. In your iPhone or smartphone, we have this uh, uh, map up brief where, which tells you where you are. And this makes use of a global positioning system that uh, uh, most of which was uh, uh, launched by the uh, United States and there are like 20 of them going around the Earth. So each of them has a very accurate clock, the uh, uh, atomic clock, which sends signal at a very accurate rate. And what happens is that if you look at the sky and if you uh, see at least four of them and uh, get the time from each one of them, then you can just simply solve the linear equation to find out where you are and what time it is. You need to see four satellites because you need to know your three spatial coordinate and one time. But in order, of course, uh, for you to be able to uh, understand where you are and what time it is, the clock has to be accurate. But since the, these uh, satellites are flying at a very high uh, 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 altitude, so that means that gravitational force is weaker. Gravitational force is weaker, so that means that time is actually clicking faster. At the same time, these satellites are moving very fast, so that means that there is a special relativity effect of clock is actually seen as if they are uh, clicking slower. So combining these effects, and please excuse the uh, unit of length that I'm using here. This, was, this slide was prepared for American audience. And, uh, but uh, if you take into account these effects, then the actually the, uh, the, you would get an error of 7.5 miles per day, so that would be totally useless. So if Einstein were not born uh, in our world, then uh, we would have encountered a very funny situation because most of the technology that we employ to develop uh, GPS and launch them would not require neither special or general relativity. So you could imagine a planet where you have advanced civilization and they launched GPS without Einstein and they realized that it was totally off. So, so they, they had to figure out what what was the cause of such an error? So fortunately, we had an Einstein, so, so we knew in advance that we had to calibrate these effects. Okay, so anyway, so uh, 1915, which is uh, 
101 years ago, uh, Einstein presented his uh, equation uh, of gravitational force at the Prussian Academy of Science in Berlin. And uh, next year, the following year, 1916, uh, he predicted gravitational wave. The, his first paper was not quite right, so he revised it into two years later. And 99 years later, September 14, last year, LIGO Observatory, uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory, uh, made the first direct detection of uh, gravitational force. So this is one of the LIGO Observatory uh, with four kilometer arm. They have laser light going back and forth, measuring the length of this arm, or in fact, the relative length of these two arms. So when the gravitational wave comes through, then the relative length changes, and that is what is being measured. And uh, this was uh, reported, for example, by New York Times above the fourth in the front page. Uh, so amazing thing is that, uh, so you, had actually, you have actually two of these observatories, one in Hanford, Washington, and uh, the other in Louisiana, and these two waveforms uh, totally coincided, just like here. So this gravitational force was emitted by a pair of black holes, about 30 solar mass uh, each. So it's a big uh, black hole. And in fact, this was, I was told that for astrophysicists, these were surprised because they had never observed such heavy black hole. And they actually have, do not have a good idea yet of how such big black hole uh, should have formed, 1.3 billion years away. And uh, these two observatories detected identical signal. And also, they were prepared for it, so they actually calculated exactly what kind of waveform that you'd observe by using numerical general relativity, the computer simulation of general relativity. And that also agreed. So that gave us confidence that they actually observed the uh, 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 merger of two black holes. So, so Caltech is actually one of the uh, two uh, uh, major contributors to the project. The other is MIT. And we have a headquarter of LIGO uh, laboratory at Caltech. So when this was announced, we had a gathering at Caltech. The announcement itself was made at the National Press Club at Washington, DC. So I took this photograph, and I got some souvenir. So but anyway, so important thing is that this detection of gravitational wave confirmed Einstein's prediction 99 years ago, uh, in fact, 100 years ago from today, and opened a new window to the universe that uh, until this time, we were observing the universe using electromagnetic waves, like light or X-ray. But now we have a totally new way to observe the universe. And uh, it opened the possibility to test Einstein theory at st strong gravitational fields and see whether the theory should be modified or not. There is actually a very nice news uh, uh, last month where uh, the second detection was announced. So the first one was not coincidence. And, uh, Again, these were very heavy black holes. So these purple uh, uh, objects are black, ho well, black holes that had been observed before the gravitational wave detection by X-rays. And the one detected by gravitational force are heavier than those. So it looks like there are actually things that uh, uh, we don't yet understand at the universe that are being revealed th by the gravitational wave. And now so we have two samples, so we can sort of estimate how frequently that we're going to be observing the gravitational wave. And in fact, uh, the LIGO laboratory is actually undergoing uh, imp uh, improvement. And I'm told that uh, in a few years, the sensitivity would increase from 3 to 10. But if you increase sensitivity by 3, then actually the volume of the space where you can observe will be cubed. So it's going to be either 27 or 1,000 times more frequent than uh, uh, we are doing now. So it is estimated that the LIGO detector will start detecting like a thousand gravitational wave events from black hole merger per year. So that's going to be very exciting uh, uh, possibility, opportunity. So anyway, so, so, so this is about a half uh, of my uh, allocated time. And this is exactly half of my presentation. So I started out saying that gravity is a force which for us, it's obvious, but it wasn't obvious to uh, ancient Greeks. And gravity is also weak, which is surprising, but it is true. And the important observation by Einstein is that it is in the eye of beholder. And he formulated it as, uh, as, a, as that the gravity is warping of space and time. So the title of my talk is uh, 
what is gravity? And Einstein gave the answer that it's warping of space-time. So I could finish my talk now. However, I still have 30 minutes, so, so I should go on. And in fact, uh, it would have been a good answer, except that quantum mechanics, uh, unless, uh, except that we actually also discovered quantum mechanics. And that changed the whole thing. So in fact, gravity is very hard to marry with uh, quantum mechanics. So uh, four years ago, uh, 4th of July, which is uh, the day after tomorrow, the uh, CERN laboratory in Geneva announced the discovery of Higgs particle. So this is Mr. Uh, the Professor uh, uh, Peter Higgs. And uh, this is the front page of New York Times uh, with the uh, autograph by Peter, Fee, Peter Higgs. And uh, so one of the important uh, uh, point of this discovery is that this completed the standard model of uh, uh, elementary particles. So standard model was sort of constructed by theoretical physicists uh, decades ago, and uh, essentially sort of completed uh, in uh, mid-70s. But uh, the, 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 there are 17 elementary particles in the standard model, but Higgs particle was not discovered until four years ago. So this is actually sort of stuffed animal toys of uh, standard model elementary particles that you can order online. And th this was actually, I copied it uh, 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 like uh, five years ago. So at that time, Higgs boson was not discovered. So this was sort of in the category of theoretical particle. And these were detected particle. But now it should belong to this category. So, so this is uh, uh, this complete the sort of uh, uh, current uh, 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 standard model elementary particle essentially uh, uh, describe all high energy physics phenomena that have been detected at the, uh, 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 in the laboratory, except for mass of uh, a neutrino, which requires some slight modification to, uh, to this table. However, uh, this is not the end of the story, because in fact, if you go to this website, uh, there are actually two uh, theoretical particles listed in this category. One is Higgs boson, but the other is graviton, uh, which exchanges the gravitational force. So, so in, in this uh, table of elementary particle, you have photon, which exchanges the electromagnetic force, gluon, which exchanges the strong force, and W and Z boson, which exchanges weak force. So those are three of the four fundamental force. But the subject of this talk today is gravitational force. And the particle that's supposed to communicate uh, gravitational force has not been discovered. And in fact, including that is a very difficult thing uh, uh, in the theory of elementary particle. Partly because, as I explained, the gravity is warping of space and time. But on the other hand, uh, things are intrinsically uncertain in quantum mechanics. In the classical world formulated by, for example, Isaac Newton's uh, classical mechanics, the future uh, is totally predicted. So for example, I throw this toward Boris then if I do it very well, I'm going to hit him. And it's totally predictable. Whereas uh, in the quantum world, uh, it's not clear the, what exactly the trajectory of these objects are. But if you combine that with gravity, that means that space and time become uncertain. And uh, quantum mechanics and uh, 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 the uh, 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 standard model of elementary particle, for that matter, are formulated assuming that the space and time exist, and then uh, in it, uh, the theory is formulated. And the fluctuating world of space and time, it's not clear how you can formulate uh, such theory. So reconciling uh, quantum and gravity has been the holy grail of modern physics. It looks like in the Hollywood. Uh, these are also very important concepts that are sort of employed in the recent movies. But uh, combining them uh, uh, has been sort of one of the very uh, uh, important questions, unsolved questions uh, in theoretical physics uh, homework from the 20th century. And so far, the only consistent way we know how to do this is superstring theory. Superstring theory postulates that fundamental building block of matters are not point particle. So these are not elementary particle, but elementary strings. And the vibration and the configuration and the wave function of these strings uh, describe uh, the 17 uh, uh, elementary particle in standard model particle physics, uh, as it is expected. 
So that is what is expected. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons we are, uh, are so much uh, fascinated by string theory is that uh, string theory actually seems to contain all the ingredients needed to build this table of standard model of particle physics, including uh, graviton. Moreover, string theory helped solve some of the deepest mystery of quantum gravity, such as the origin of Hawking radiance uh, from black hole, and led to new concept of space and time, such as holography. Uh, I imagine some of the speakers uh, uh, today may uh, touch on it, so I don't have time to go uh, much deeper into it. So as Boris said, uh, uh, I have been working with a team of uh, uh, very talented uh, uh, visual creators in Tokyo uh, for the last three years uh, to make a three-dimensional movie uh, on super string theory, and I, I supervise, I was sort of a scientific supervisor uh, for this. Uh, the title of the movie called The Man from Nine Dimensions. I don't have time to explain where the nine come from. But uh, so I was very happy to report to you that uh, last week uh, this movie was uh, selected as the 2016 Best Educational Product Award uh, from International Planetary Society. The competition was held in, uh, uh, in Czech Republic, and the award ceremony was uh, at the uh, biannual, biannual uh, conference of uh, International Planetarium Society in uh, Warsaw, Poland. And, uh, from 16, six films sub submitted from 15 countries. So, uh, so I would like to actually show you a trailer of this movie, but I, I need to uh, sort of warn you, explain you actually what you are going to see. So the movie is for 30 minutes. I'm not going to show you 30 minutes. It's gonna be like uh, uh, two minutes. And uh, uh, so I have to, in 30 minutes, we have to explain quantum mechanics, standard model of particle physics, including Higgs effect, flavor changing uh, the uh, uh, neutrinos and uh, 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 how the, uh, and then, then we have to explain uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, the evolution of the universe, dark ages, inflation, big bang, and then try to explain why it is difficult to marry quantum mechanics and general relativity and how string theory solved all this. And the movie explains that in 30 minutes. So it's not so easy, so in order to actually sort of guide the audience through these uh, uh, ideas, uh, uh, we uh, came up with a metaphor. So the man from nine dimension is a metaphor of theory of everything. And uh, there is a, actually a group of three scientists who are, chasing, who are chasing after this mysterious man from the nine dimension. So this is a metaphor of scientists uh, uh, trying to uh, understand the fundamental laws of nature. And through that process, the man takes us to the microscopic world of elementary particles, and then going back the history of the universe and takes us to the Big Bang, etc. So, so I'm going to show you the trailer, uh, but this actually trailer uh, focus on entertain entertainment aspect of the movie, not quite scientific aspect, but uh, the actual movie contains lots of scientific content, so I hope uh, there'll be opportunity uh, for you to see the whole thing. So this is the guy. TOE? Have we found TOE? Yes. Do you recognize Carabiao Manifold? Find him and we'll have solved all the mysteries of the physical world. All possibilities exist simultaneously.
Okay, so that was the trailer. Uh, so so uh, we, I was very we are very fortunate to have been able to sort of uh, uh, get the service of a very talented uh, 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 visual creator. And in fact, uh, Takashi Shimizu is a primarily a horror movie director. He makes lots of horror movies. And uh, so that was, he was very, it was a lot of fun to work with because he came up with lots of visual image that I would not have thought about. But anyway, so I highly recommend you to, if you go to uh, uh, Japan, uh, it's actually currently shown at the uh, Science Museum called Miraita. So, yeah. anyway, so uh, the actually uh, uh, marrying general relativity and quantum mechanics also poses lots of interesting questions in mathematics. And so that is the reason for this spring mass conference that we have been uh, enjoying uh, this week, thanks to the uh, hospitality and organization by our friends in Paris. And it's partly because general relativity describes gravity in terms of warping of space and time, namely in terms of geometry, whereas quantum mechanics describes the microscopic world of elementary particles in terms of algebra. So the study of quantum gravity and string theory, therefore, is opening a new line of research in mathematics, which connects geometry and algebra in unexpected way. So this is one of the reasons why uh, sort of this area has been so fruitful for both mathematicians, because it poses an interesting question, but for, and also for physicists, because techniques developed by mathematicians have been very, uh, turned out to be very powerful. So, this kind of development also gave us lots of new insight into string theory, which led us to understand the theory and maybe possibly applications of the theory to uh, important question about the universe. And one of the important questions I want to pose is why is the sky dark at night? And this is actually closely related to the mystery of gravity. So this is, I included it as one of the seven wonders of, uh, 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 of, the gr of gravity. So why the night sky dark? Well, you say, well, because the sign's on the other side of the earth, that's one answer. But it's not as obvious that, as that. So, so there are lots of stars in the universe. And uh, so suppose you have stars around us, and then, then there are more stars uh, twice as, uh, as, as far away. If you go twice as far as uh, us, then of course, a light from each star is uh, 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 one fourth, because uh, the, 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 the strength goes like, uh, one over, uh, uh, decreases it like a square of the distance. However, if we go uh, twice as, uh, twice as, uh, 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 twice the distance, then there are actually four times more stars. So that means that some total of light coming from these uh, stars is actually the same as some total of light coming from these stars. So if you go to twice as many, you get the same amount of light. If you go to three times away, you get the same amount of time. So if the universe is infinite, then you get infinite amount of light. So why is it that the, the, the sky is dark at night? The sky should be infinitely bright. So this is called Olbers paradox. You can try to avoid this question by saying that well, there are dust in the, sky, in the universe, etc. But dust absorbs the light, but then store energy and emit the light. So it won't help you. So this actually, the correct answer to this question was interestingly pointed out by Edgar Allan Poe in uh, uh, one of his last uh, beautiful writing called Eureka. So let me read what he wrote. So were the succession of stars endless, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity like that displayed by the galaxy, since there could be absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. So this is exactly the formulation of the Olbers paradox uh, 20 years before. So he proposed the solution. The only mode, therefore, in which under such a state of affair, we could comprehend the void which our telescope finds in innumerable directions would be by supposing that the distance of the invisible background is so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach us at all. So this turned out to be a correct answer because uh, uh, eight years later, uh, Edwin Hubble in Pasadena uh, uh, the, uh, over the uh, Mount Wilson. Actually, uh, from my office, I can see uh, Mount, Mount Wilson Observatory. So when I visit, uh, come to my office, I can actually brag saying that this is where the people discovered the expansion of the universe. 
But anyway, so he discovered the expansion of the universe by observing how the uh, galaxy at distance uh, 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 rec is receding from us. And this is a solution to this problem because uh, this means that uh, if the universe is expanding, there must be hotter and denser in the past, namely there is a big bang. There was a big bang. So, so the universe began, by now we understand that the universe began in 13.8 billion years ago. And the light from star beyond that time would not have reached us. So this is exactly how Edgar Allan Poe expected the solution. To, uh, the, uh, the, this is exactly the solution that Edgar Allan Poe expected. And this was confirmed by, by this type of observation. So why is the sky dark at night? This simple question had a surprising answer that it's because there was a beginning of the universe. So in the next decade or so, uh, we'll have lots of exciting uh, experiments and observation that would significantly advance our understanding of the beginning of the universe, and uh, some of which may provide a way to test the string theory, too. So, so this will be very exciting. Maybe uh, some of the speakers will touch on that later. So the final wonder that uh, I'd like to pose is why is gravity is just so. So as I said, the universe was born 13.8 billion years ago and very slowly developed to uh, our current stage. It took, us, it took a while. And that was very fortunate for us because it gave us a home, this beautiful Earth. Uh, and uh, it gave us long time, uh, 1.3 billion years, to evolve from microbes to homo sapiens, intellectual enough to ask questions such as, what is gravity? So why is the universe was sort of stable and were able to accommodate us for such a long time? One reason is actually the, is gra because gravity is weak. Because gravity were stronger, most stars would have collapsed into black hole, so there would be no, no Earth, no civilization. If the gravity were weaker, then star and planet would not have formed at all. So there will be just dust floating uh, in, the, in, in the universe. So in either case, uh, it would not have been possible for uh, somebody co to come up with a question of what is gravity. So the question is why is the gravity just weak but not too weak so that we can have stars and uh, planets and things like that. So one possible explanation is anthropic principle. It is just so because we exist. This is sort of uh, a funny uh, way to formulate the answer. But in certain cases, actually, it gives a correct answer. The famous example where anthropic principle gives the correct explanation is the distance between the sun and earth. This is one of the uh, very interesting questions that puzzled, again, people from uh, ancient times. That, for example, ancient Greeks were able to measure the distance between the earth and moon, and rather accurately, and then, with some large error, we were also able to measure the distance from the uh, uh, Earth to the Sun. And uh, if, you, if you know how to do it, then the next thing is to try to explain it. And so there are lots of, lots of theories to try to deduce the distance between stars and uh, Sun and planet and the Earth uh, from fundamental laws of nature. And in fact, uh, Johannes Kepler had also the theory. So, so in one of his early books, uh, he speculated that the six planets, so those days there are six planets known, have orbit of six spheres inscribing and circumscribing five platonic solids appropriately ordered. And he thought that this suggests a God's uh, geometric plan for the universe. So this is actually Kepler's model of uh, planets. So he tried to deduce that from fundamental principle, like beautiful mathematics. OK. <laughs> uh, Yes, but of course, uh, what happened is that after that, he uh, got access to uh, uh, observational da data by Tycho Brahe and realized that this is not quite accurate and then, then reconsidered and then came up with the elliptic uh, orbit model of planets. So nowadays, uh, we know that it's not possible to derive distance from the sun to Earth based on fundamental principle. 
because uh, we know that there are many stars in the universe, and um, by now, thanks to actually the uh, uh, Kepler telescope, that uh, many of them, large fraction of them, have planets. And some are very far away from their host star, some are very close to uh, the host star, and those are not hospitable to life. But some of them are just so that uh, uh, they can accommodate uh, uh, life, and some of them can even accommodate advanced civilization. So our current understanding is that the distance between sun and earth is not determined by fundamental laws of nature, but is environmental, that it is decided, determined just from many samples of planet, just the one which accommodate life and the intellectual life. So this is exactly what the anthropic principle tells us. So the question that uh, one may pose is that uh, do we have to employ anthrop anthropic principle to explain other features of fundamental laws of, uh, of nature? Should we give up deriving them from basic principle? Well, I don't know. This is something being discussed, and it is my hope that some of the features of fundamental laws of nature can be derived from fundamental principle, and this is one of the re reasons that drive us to, to this type of question of what is gravity. So let me summarize the seven wonders of gravity. The gravity is a force. Gravity is weak. Gravity is in the eyes of the beholder. And it is described by warping of space and time. And this could have been a good answer to the question of what is gravity. But it turns out that the microscopic world uh, has quantum mechanical feature. And it has been very hard to marry quantum mechanics with uh, gravity. And this is work in progress. And this is something that we have been discussing at this conference, too. And one of the questions that we may be able to address is uh, why the sky is dark at night, which is leading to the question of the Big Bang of the universe, and also why is the gravity so weak, but not too weak. So, so, so we, are, we are investigating getting this question, and we are meeting every year at Strings Conference, String Mass Conference, to exchange ideas. And we are very happy to be able to host both String Mass Conference and the Strings Conference in 2018 in Japan. So uh, I'd like to warmly welcome uh, all uh, uh, theoretical physicists and mathematicians interested in this area uh, to this conference. So in 2018, in June, in, uh, in the third week of June, we'll have a String Mass Conference in Tohoku University, which is just a 90 minutes train ride from the center of Tokyo, so it's very convenient. Next week, uh, in the following week, the last week of June, we'll have Strings Conference in Tropical Island of Okinawa, which is about two hour flight from Tokyo. Uh, we timed it so that it is actually after the rainy season and before the typhoon season in Okinawa. And I'm closing my finger so that uh, the global climate change in two years won't displace that, this kind of season so much. So anyway, so thank you for listening to me, and uh, hope to see you in Japan in two years. OK, thank you very much, Hiroji, for the beautiful lecture. So this, uh, this is a general public session. We have time for questions. Uh, we would primarily like to have questions from the general public, if possible. <laughs> so don't be shy uh, in asking uh, your deep uh, questions about uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental questions. We can take them in French as well. And, yeah, uh, so, so, you, so Boris can translate, I can translate the question in French I'm, to me. I may so, not be able to so translate French the French questions are <laughs> encouraged. Japanese question too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's take a question. Actually, there are many, many other Chinese questions possible. <laughs> People uh, can translate. You, you, you raise your hand. Uh, it was me, so. No, no, uh, but I guess we right, We'll take uh, this question uh, first, and then we, we have uh, over here. Yeah, so okay, I have you can a, take your question. I have a naive question. So the detection of these gravitational waves, what kind of effect does it have on mathematics or string theory, especially enumerative geometries? Say it again. The detection of gravitational waves. I would like to know, does it have any does it kind of tell us that we need to do some new things in? Well, it depends the on the source of gravitational wave. So the one that uh, LIGO is detecting, uh, uh, LIGO observatories are detecting, 
mark from uh, astrophysical black hole. So the basically, the, the question is the wavelength. So uh, uh, in this case, the source is, is pretty big. It's a big, big black hole. And uh, the gravitational uh, field near this black hole is pretty strong, but not strong enough uh, uh, to be sensitive to uh, possible modification by string theory or other uh, uh, quantum gravity effects. Uh, but this is still already very interesting because uh, they were able to accurately uh, measure the strong effect of strong gravitational field. So for example, uh, the, the first detection by LIGO has already put the most strict upper bound on mass of graviton. So the mass of graviton has been measured by various sources, but this one puts the strongest upper bound to date uh, on the on the mass of gra graviton in the general theory of relativity, if you naively quantize it, it's supposed to be massless. So if, we, if graviton has mass, it would be a strong modification. So this one gave a strongest upper bound for it. But it'd be more exciting uh, to be able to detect a uh, gravitational uh, uh, wave from primordial origin, that is, uh, from the beginning of the universe, because uh, it is expected that uh, the quantum fluctuation of space and time during the inflation area uh, can be imprinted, imprinted in a gravitational wave, some of which can be of course also imprinted in the B model polarization of cosmic microwave background radiation. And those would be very sensitive, potentially, uh, to specific models of uh, inflation, and, uh, and then that can put constraint on inflation model. And uh, uh, there are lots of uh, string theoretical constraint on the type of inflation model that you can construct. So, so those are, uh, are potentially more interesting. So the, my answer to your question is that it depends on the source of gravitational wave. So the, the one currently being uh, observed by LIGO probably would not, but uh, the one that will be hopefully coming on in the next decade or so. So for example, there are lots of b model polarization experiments being developed. Some of that is satellite. I think one, I have a picture of one of them. There is a, a Japanese project that actually I'm involved in. So this one, uh, it's called Lightbird. So this is a satellite uh, observatory that's supposed to measure the beam mode polarization. Sensitive enough, possibly to exclude some of the inflation models. So, so those are, so, so my answer to your question is depends on the source. Okay, thank you very much. Let's take us, uh, another question here. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, forgive me in advance for this non-expert question, but uh, you said that uh, one possible way to make quantum and gravity uh, theory uh, compatible is the superstring uh, right. theory. So, uh, so this is still a hypothesis. Yeah, so that, that was my question. What, what is the state of the art? Are we done with unifying the four forces or is there still uh, work to do? So. Uh, to my knowledge, the uh, string theory is, is the most promising candidate uh, of unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics. And uh, because, uh, uh, as I said, it, it contains all the ingredients uh, uh, to derive a standard model of elementary particle we know and has been tested. And uh, it's consistently uh, quantized uh, general relativity and solved some of the fundamental questions that are posed, like, uh, Hawking's uh, 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 information loss puzzle of uh, black hole. And, uh, but it has not been t tested experimentally, observationally, in a sense that uh, string theory makes lots of prediction, but uh, we are still developing uh, experimental observation to test that, and uh, it takes time. So for example, uh, as you go uh, further into sort of frontier of science, uh, it, it's taking longer and longer uh, to verify uh, uh, prediction. For example, it took 50 years for the prediction of Higgs particle to be verified at CERN. It took 100 years for uh, the gravitational wave to be de detected. Some, so those requires a lot of technical advance. Even, for example, Newton's theory of uh, uh, universal gravitation, it took 100 years. Uh, for the two objects on the Earth, uh, the gravitational force between the two objects on the Earth to be uh, experimentally verified and tested by Cavendish. So, so it requires lots of effort. And uh, uh, 
So this, the, the question that uh, uh, being asked before about, uh, and then in my answer to his question, I talked about the B-mode polarization detection. So those are potentially an avenue where the prediction of string theory can be tested. Uh, so, uh, and that, that's why currently the string theory is still a hypothesis that is still waiting for experimental verification. But uh, since there are no other ideas in the market, so we are trying to develop this theory in particular. Thank you for asking. More questions? Again, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's take again uh, Hiroshi for the wonderful lecture. Thank you. So we're going to take about 10 minutes break and uh, we convene at uh, uh, yeah, 10, 10 uh, 25, let's say, uh, with the next speaker, uh, Andrea.